be God's kingdom, now and forever. book of the prophet Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house, the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house, 
with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will do no such thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thank you, to God. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
to John. Lord, 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 Lord. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark. And Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Holy God, your people come for nourishment, to be touched, to be moved, to be changed, to be fed. Come, quicken our hearts, open our ears, speak to your children. Amen. 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 Good morning, friends. Good morning. What a blessing it has been to be with you. <clears throat> the gospel today is familiar for those who have grown up in the church or those who have just been around life. You know the story, the feeding of the 5,000. Now maybe your educated self says, well, that's nuts. That didn't happen. And maybe you get lost in interpreting, and, and uh, maybe it causes, well, for me anyway, lots of questions, lots of, un I get all sort of tangled up. We're going to be in this chapter of John for five weeks. So I'm going to let the next person untangle you. <laughs> Good of me. <laughs> and I want to talk about David. 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 I just have a picture of the statue of David. And I think, I wonder if there aren't a lot of people, women in particular, but maybe a lot of people, who think that's a statue we should get rid of. <laughs> David was a piece of work. He was a shepherd. He was identified by Samuel. He was the youngest of his brothers and was a musician. 
and a good shepherd, and he was scrappy, and he was able to get wild animals away from the sheep. And he ended up in the court of Saul, playing the harp for him, and brought him joy. And he was also a soldier, and he went out and defeated the Philistines, who were perceived to be the enemies of God. And so he grew in popularity. Great candidate, right? People start to swell behind him, which makes Saul very jealous. And you may know some of the twists and turns of that story. We'll be walking through it in the next few weeks. But at this point um, of the story, sorry, you might want. Mark is so organized, he even put a spot here for my <laughs> I digress. There's so much in the text today that I want to just tell you one piece about David that isn't in today's text, because we've been talking about the gospel, and there's something that has been on my mind as we've been walking through this uh, story of David, which is that when David was uh, moving with his, his band and with the people, and they have the ark, and the ark is in this, um, this covering, and he is traveling, and then one of the, um, I don't know if his name was Uzziah, I should remember, but it's not important. Someone touches the ark, and they're killed, right, along the way. So this was a couple weeks ago. So what's not in the text that we got was that David said, I don't want that thing. <laughs> That's too powerful. Why don't we put it in your town? And he leaves it at this other town, and then he uh, proceeds to Jerusalem, where he ends up setting up shop and building his kingdom. And then word gets to him that this guy's town is doing really well, the one that has the ark, and so he says, well, bring it to me. That sticks out in my mind as, as I read through David, because, I don't know, I think it's killer. Like, we have, he, he consistently says, and God was with him, and God is with me, and God delivered this army and that army, and God gets stuck on the victories, right? But then when there's fear, then he says, okay, um, that's a little too scary. That's a little too much, right? So you hang on to that. And then he sees the blessing, and he says, oh, no, no, I do want that, right? And I think sometimes our faith journey can be a little bit like that, that we enjoy the church, maybe we lean in, we start to learn, we open ourselves to God's love and power, and then we hear a story like the feeding of the 5,000, and we say, that's a little out there. That's a little much. I'm not going to go out there and say I'm a Christian and say, and I believe that Jesus fed all these people from a couple of fish and some bread. So we either spiritualize it or, or downplay our faith a little bit and just don't get too excited. Or we encounter David. <laughs> As my grandmother would say, the jerk. We weren't from Boston, so we thought this was really funny. How she would say, jerk, he's a jerk. I guess it's not funny here. Anyway, <laughs> we lived in the Midwest, we thought it was funny. Anyway, so maybe you hear this story of basically two men, right? This story is about David and Uzziah, the Hittite, right? And it lays out this adventure of David's. Now, he's king, and it starts out by saying, this was the time when the kings went into battle. David is at home. He's not in the battle, so he's already, to start, not doing what he should be doing, right? So he's at home, and he sees the woman bathing across the way, and he says, who is that? Go find out. Send these little people, and they find out, and then they come back, and they say who it is, and he says, bring her to me. Now, when they tell who it is, they say, he's married to this guy, right? So 
So he's, we don't have much of the backstory, but we don't get the impression that he cares. He says, I want her. So she comes. And he lies with her. And word gets to him that she's pregnant. And what does he do? He says, how can I fix this? How can I cover this so that it doesn't reflect badly on me? So it doesn't make me look bad. And so the machinations begin. Her husband, bring me her husband, right? Bring her me. He's, uh, he's, on, he's on the front line, sir. Bring him, bring him to me. So he comes, and, and during this would have taken a while. So during this journey, you can imagine he's like, okay, okay, how can I, how can I cover this up? Okay. So he comes and he says, um, you deserve a break. You look tired, but you know I've heard good things about you. Why don't you take a break? Just you can chill, put your feet up. Great to have you in our army. Why don't you just stay for a night or so? And he's hoping that this man's first <clears throat> impulse will be, yay, I want to go be with my wife. Now, never mind the fact that we assume that she'll want to be with him, but I digress. So he does it. He stays right outside with the servants and fleets, and then word gets to David, uh, he didn't go home. <sighs> All right, why didn't you go home? And he says, you know, the ark, and we're fighting for God, and the people are, I'm not going to go home. I'm just going to wait here for instruction. So he says, all right, all right. well, come and, and be with me tonight, then. And he gets him drunk. Surely drunk he'll go home. He'll have beer goggles. So it is his wife, but you know what I'm saying. That he will go home and be with his wife. And he doesn't go home and be with his wife. So we need plan C. Okay, so he writes a letter and he has he has Uriah carry the letter. Sends him back to the front with the letter sealed that says, get this guy killed. Okay, go into go into the battle and then step back and let him and his company get killed. So then the story will proceed as he will continue to work out the implications and results. So this too, combined with the statue, might cause us to step back from Christianity. Because obviously the, the Hebrew Bible is, is incorporated and brought through and is, Jesus is in the line of David. So this, too, might create distance for us from the scriptures. He was a bad guy, and he's king, and we lift him up in the church somehow? And No, no, that, I don't do that. that. That's not me. I'm a Christian, but I, I'm not that, and not that, and not that. But I am. I go to church. And you know what? I don't blame you if this is your truth. I get it. And you know what? It happens inside me, too. And it's a discipline to say, these are the holy scriptures. I'm going to stand here, and as repulsive as it is that these two men treat, well, a story about two men, but that David treats her as an object, and some have called it actually rape, right? And certainly adultery and all of this. I'm going to stand here and listen for God. And this is hard work. Because it's so easy, or it's much easier, I should say, to just put it over there. To say, yeah, but not that. But to stand there and say, this is part of my tradition and the story of my fellowship. I'm going to try to stand here and listen. A few years ago, as a Lenten discipline, I decided to listen to conservative podcasts. I said, I can do this, because they are part of the body of Christ, 
and I will listen, usually I was able to make it through most of it, but there was one time that the caster began, the very, like, within the very first two sentences were, the mainline church is a tool of Satan, and they have lesbian priests who are destroying the kingdom of God. And I'm like, we're breathing, we're breathing. I didn't make it too far on that one. But the rest of them were not quite as severe, but certainly intimated as much. You know, our, the, their churches are dying. You know, God's true call is to this other way of being Christian. You know, but I know that God has said, believers are to be one. This is one of Jesus' last prayers. Please, I pray they would be one. I'm like, I'm calling myself a Christian. They're calling themselves Christians, so I'm going to stand here and see if I can find God in this. And usually I did. Usually I did. I found something. And even in the act of the obedience, there was change. And I was changed. We are in a tribal moment, right? I mean, they're even saying, now it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated, right? But even before that, now we have two differently named tribes. But, you know, the tribal, the energy, the pulling, the polarization, Russia helped. Right? And all of it is, I'm here, you're here. And we're real Americans. And I thought we were Americans too, but we're really enlightened. And you're really stupid. And whatever it is, right? And just entrenched. How easy that is, right? To stick together. A couple quick things. I get too many robocalls and too many people who want money because I made the mistake of actually giving it once and then you're toast. So I got a call five years ago, or sorry, four years ago, from a, a marketer or a fundraiser who said, and can you believe these women who support Trump? Can you believe it? You know, and she had this whole list of why they were not even women, basically. You know? And they blazy blazy blah and they blah 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 blah. And I said, it sounds like they're angry. I didn't hear much for a second. Even though they have their script, you know, they flip, they say this, turn to this page. I don't think they had a page for that. There wasn't a page for, oh. They're human. They're like me in some fundamental ways. I get angry. There are things I'm angry about, sometimes even to the point of it's shaping the way that I spend my money and my time and the way that I vote. I'm not telling that story to glorify myself. I'm just saying that's an example of what it takes to stop and be present with truth. And so, what is the truth about these stories? Well, they just lay it out there. You know, people who, I had a guy in high school say, I think a bunch of people got drunk one night and wrote the Bible. And you know, you're in high school, you don't know anything. But, you know, just this idea that, that we have more sophisticated versions of, a bunch of people who wrote this down to serve their own psychological needs and fears and whatever. Okay. No. If that was the case, they would not have David. They would not, even in the context of the text, he comes off as a really bad guy in moments like this. The text does not apologize, nor does it say why he did it. His, his mommy did whatever, or his, you know, we don't, we don't know. Or maybe he's just a jerk, right? But the story is what it is. It just lays it out there. There it is, the truth. This happened. What does it mean for us to sit with that and just experience the story as it happens? The psalm today, 
when you sang it. But today's psalm talks about, um, that we didn't read, but it says that no one is holy. No one is righteous. And our, uh, find it. our, our, pre- our collect also echoes this theme that I can't find, but you can look at it. Trust me. That this is the theme, that none of us gets it. None of us gets it all. Not one of us is perfectly holy. And we talked last week about that the word for sin is actually a missed mark. And the bullseye is a perfect light. And all of us miss the mark. We are all sinners. We are all 100% sinners. And we are 100% saint. It's a tension. In Anglican world, we call it the already and the not yet. Right? Tension. We can sit with those tensions. We are not perfect. We are not even super regularly righteous. At least, I'm not. Obsessing about this leads a mess. Our sins lead to messes as well. We make messes. David was, Uriah was not the only one killed, his whole like group was killed. They pulled back from his battalion. And she's pregnant. And his sin, his selfishness, and his pride, and just blowing, bowling over people, amassing power, like The consequences for so many lives are huge. But you know what? I do things that have consequences too. Not that so perhaps. But last story I'll tell you. I know you guys probably are used to shorter sermons. My apologies. Last night, well, the last couple of days, weeks really, I have been obsessing about my lawn. My backyard, I spend all my time trying to fix my backyard, right? So I am planting this grass, and now I use this thing called grow traps. I'm trying. I try all sorts of things. And you prepare the ground carefully, put all the good stuff in it, and then you roll this stuff out, and you water it. Now, when I get focused on something like this, I ignore everyone. I don't go to the dinner table. I like, okay, I'm ordering a pizza. You can bring me a slice, or I can go get one, right? I'm going to get this. I have to get this done. It's going to rain. Blah, 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 all my reasons, right? And I have a child and a wife who are inside, like, okay, mom's busy. Forget the fact that we usually have dinner together. We usually have a ritual. But no, I've got to finish this for whatever reasons. I'm sure I have some that I think are very compelling. So I'm killing myself, right, putting this together, and it's affecting them. Is it my pride? I don't know, but I'm obsessed, right? So then I come in, and my daughter has a tick, and we're looking at the tick, and I'm like, I got to go. I got my whole routine that I do the night before a service, and I can't get to it, so then I start, I'm going to make a little fire. It's very late at night, right? I'm, I'm lighting the fire, and I look up, and there is a huge family of raccoons really close to me, including this little one that came out kind of out. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a family reunion. So all these raccoons are tearing up my grow traps. <laughs> I'm like, get out of here! It's like 11 o'clock at night. I start banging on the fire pit, yelling at them. Now, of course, we have a quiet neighborhood. <laughs> Actually, it's sort of in a valley, so anything that you, you know, even if you raise your voice, it sort of carries, right? So I wake up probably a lot of people, and I definitely wake up the people in my house, and my daughter comes down, and she gets afraid, and she's worried about the cats getting eaten by these raccoons, and I'm upset about my lawn, and so I grab this hose, and I start, like, 
braining the raccoons. And then I'm like, I've got to light this fire. Maybe I'll smoke out the raccoons. Because the first thing I tell you, they come right back out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my mind. And my wife says, can you please come in and comfort your daughter? And what do I say? Can you? I got business here, okay? Can you comfort her? And, you know, through the crazy, you know, I'm like, all right, fine. I'll be in. And I try to clean up and forget it. That's toast. I have to let it go. I come in. Suddenly the truth hits me, and I'm sad, and I feel guilty, and my daughter's apologizing. And I, it's a mess. And you know what? Life is messy. We make messes. And I'm apologizing. My wife was sleeping when I left. I'm sure I'll hear about it when I get home. I'm going to catch it. So this little tiny moment is filled with this mix of of mess and sincerity and struggle and anger and all this junk. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the 100% sinner and the 100% saint, right? I mean, my saintness in that moment only came from my awareness that I have really screwed up. I hate a mess. Telling the truth to myself the hardest part. I told the truth to them too. But telling the truth to myself that maybe my priorities were a little whack. Maybe I shouldn't have woken up the neighborhood. And maybe I shouldn't have sprayed that tiny little raccoon in the face. I don't know if Jerry's out on that. But all of it presents to me a kind of mosh pit, a kind of mess. Like I made a mess. And if I move forward from that and spend the rest of my time, oh, why was I messed? Why did I make that mess? Like, then I miss the next moment and I make more mess. And here's, here's the gospel piece. If I stop and say, yeah, I made a mess, I'm kind of a mess sometimes. I'm kind of conflicted and screw up and there are consequences and then I do a little bit right and then I don't. And you know what? These are the people that God came to be with and be among and love and save. Right? And if I'm sitting there going, and Jesus is walking by saying, I got this. I got you. I can bring you life even in your mess. How is Jesus the son of David? How is David part of Christ? David is the truth that I live. That's the truth. Sometimes I think God's with me, and I make justifications, and I hurt people. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I play beautiful music, metaphorically and literally. None of that is what justifies me before God. None of that is why I'm a Christian. The things I do right, the things I do wrong. It is the blood of Jesus, it is the power of Christ, and the Holy Spirit coming up against that true story that is the hope of the gospel. And so that's just one example for you to take with you, to think about your own life, if you're so inclined, to sit with messy, difficult stories, to sit with messy, difficult people, to sit with yourself and your own messy difficultness, and know that that is the hope of the gospel. As is, God loves you. And God will be with you. It's all good. It's all good. Amen.
believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, of all the nations and the sea. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal God of the Father, God of the God, the light of the light, the true God of the true God, the God of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us extend to one another a sign of us. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. 